Hello, I'm Carla Grandori. I'm director of the Quellos High Throughput Screening Corps at the University of Washington. And I'm also an affiliate investigator at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center. Today, I will tell you uh, about high throughput screening and an application for identifying new therapy for cancer. It is uh, an honor to be a part of this uh, new program. I think it's a wonderful idea, and I just hope that uh, both my talk and perhaps in other venues, uh, I can inspire other investigators to really bring their idea out of their lab and uh, talk to people, see and if there are potential applications, because after all, why are we working so hard if not to put our inventions to good use? So um, with that, I will, my talk will have three, uh, three parts. Uh, first, uh, why I got interested in cancer, um, and then a little bit of an example of applying this new technology for a cancer problem, and uh, how um, this technology is made available at the Quellos High Throughput Screening Corps for all University of Washington investigators, and uh, finally, how out of what the work at Quellos inspired me to really uh, fuel this approach and how to do that uh, by starting a new organization, a uh, nonprofit organization, which will fund uh, this approach. So um, 1976, um, at a time where I was about to decide what to study uh, at the university, my grandmother was diagnosed with cancer, and uh, she had inspired me to science, and uh, some of our last conversation with this orange medicine that I felt made her more sick than helping her, told me molecular biology is going to revolutionize how we practice medicine. And uh, with that sentence, I turned around and signed up for medical school. And it was a long journey. Uh, first, trying to understand what is cancer. And uh, medical school quite didn't do it. And so I decided to uh, continue studying molecular biology of oncogenes for a long time. And uh, most of these years, I spent it at the bench. And I think that's one difference that uh, there is on, on people, uh, perhaps in, in, in my position, have spent many years directing research of others. I worked at the bench most of these years. And in 2006, uh, I went into a crisis and felt that, is my work really uh, going toward a cure, or am I working and trying to understand how oncogenes work, how cancer cells work, but there was a disconnection. So um, here's the opportunity, and this is the first lesson, go for change. When you feel that you're stuck, go for a change. And the opportunity was uh, to join Rosetta, a small biotech, a subsidiary of Merck, and uh, I felt, oh, what a best place to be connected to Merck, one of the kings in uh, drug, uh, drug uh, in making drugs. Uh, and in fact, Rosetta worked very closely with the oncology franchise of Merck. And what they had pioneered, they pioneered new technologies to exploit genomic information. And they utilized instruments, not quite like this, but more, more like this. So this is a liquid handling robotics instrument. And what they per this is the kind of instrumentation that pharma normally uses to test compounds. But what Rosetta had done, they adapted this technology to test genes. So here are the, the two major discoveries that Rosetta knew how to really exploit uh, and have at their fingertips. They exploit the knowledge of the new human genome and the ability through silencing RNAs to inactivate one gene at the time. And, we, and the discovery, in fact, of silencing RNAs uh, gained the Nobel Prize in 2006. So this is all very recent. So um, this is uh, Craig Mello and Andrew Fire who discovered, um, were awarded the Nobel Prize for this discovery. So how could this breakthrough be applied to cancer? Um, and here it is, it's a slide that has a, uh, more words, and it, it's because I like for people that's not in the field to, how, um, to see how, what we think of cancer. So every cancer cell uh, survives because it has a transcriptional program uh, that 
keeps its survival. And we can think of, that, of those genes as locks. They lock and unlock the ability of this cancer cell to grow. And there are many possibilities. We have about 30,000 genes. So we are able to interrogate with this sRNA library the function of every single gene. And there are also chemical keys, in thousands of them, that could be potential drugs against genes. So if we find the genes that sort of maintain a cancer cells, we can also hope to find the chemical keys that block these genes. And how do we do it is through use, using high-throughput screening. So this is uh, utilizing this robotic instrumentation. Now, I will show you one example, finding the locks for MYC-driven cancer. MYC is an oncogene which is involved in many human cancers. And here, what we can do, so we went silence every single gene. Uh, we focus on the druggable genome and ask which of these genes are essential uh, for cells that have aberrant expression of MYC. And when we inactivate this gene, the cells die while a normal cell, if we inactivate the gene, still survives. And so, um, why focusing on MYC? This is an example that MYC is implicated in many human cancers, often through gene amplification. And the example I will give you today is an application to neuroblastoma, a pediatric cancer, when the MYC, is, the MYC gene is amplified, has extremely poor prognosis, less than 20% survival. And this is, a, a, showed a survival uh, curve that shows that patients with amplification of MYC, they have a very um, you know, sharp um, curve while without amplification, they do fairly well. And I brought here a, a, an example of what type of, of therapy uh, kids with neuroblastoma with MYC amplified go through. So they had several surgeries, they have an intravenous line uh, for drug administration, eight months of intensive chemotherapy, dozens of invasive testing procedure, daily cocktail of drugs to counteract the side effects, and yet the cancer has not responded. So the need to find urgent alternative to chemotherapies is, um, is there. So here is how we went about. We took cells that have normal levels of, of uh, MYC that are controlled, cell, cells that have MYC just as high as the cells in the neuroblastoma. And then we put in these little trays, and each tray has about 384 wells. So we can test per tray 384 genes. So if you do the math, it doesn't take that many trays to test what we refer to as the druggable genomes, about 10,000 genes. And then we compare which gene is essential for the mix cells versus the control. And through this experiment, we found that there were about 100 genes that we could define as the locks for mix driven cancer. And then we can use bioinformatic tools to rapidly understand what are these genes, who are they. And uh, as we can see, we can generate these networks. These are based on who knows who, and so this is mix at the center. And we can find that many of the genes have connection directly or indirectly through MYC. We decided to focus on one of these genes, CK1E. I will go for a short. I will refer to CK1E. Because if we went into patient uh, samples with neuroblastoma, we could see that expression of this kinase correlated very well with MYC amplification. So it was present in real tumors. We did a Google search. Is there an inhibitor, a key against this gene? And in fact, there was an inhibitor, was derived here in Seattle. And uh, this inhibitor was now sold by Sigma. It was an inhibitor abandoned on the shelf um, because it wasn't very effective of what it was supposed to be developed for. And so it was developed to modulate circadian rhythm, sleep and uh, wake cycle. So we order this potential sleeping pill and treated mice, and uh, Masafumi Toyoshima, a postdoc in my lab, uh, inoculated neuroblastoma cells in, new, in uh, immunodeficient mice, and when they had reached a um, very visible size, uh, he started treatment, daily injection of IC261. The mice with the control um, vehicle only, uh, the tumor grew, and in all the mice treated, the tumor went away and at least stopped growing. And here is a curve of 10 mice. This experiment uh, is what convinced me that the technology was valid 
and I have more um, validation that to tell you that what we had found with the screen were valuable targets uh, for therapies. And so um, there are many more examples, and I will bring you one example. Okay, uh, so here, they, although the compound that we found was effective against the mice, we were able to protect the use of that compound for cancer with a provisional patent, and the patent was filed um, this year. So um, obviously this uh, compound, particular compound, is not a drug. We later learned that Pfizer does have a drug that targets this kinase, also developed not by the uh, oncology, but the neuropharmacology group. So we're hoping now to get the drug from Pfizer. So here's the other example. Uh, just very recently, in October, a letter to Nature says, RNAi screen, this is a similar screen to what I've done, identifies BRD4 as a therapeutic target for leukemias. What's interesting is that also they were able to use an inhibitor to BRD4, and this inhibitor was derived from benzodiazepines, which is uh, you know, a medicine known to many of us as a Valium. But what uh, this doctor and chemist at the Dana Farmer, Farber, whom I just met, uh, what he found, uh, what he noticed that these uh, benzodiazepines had binding activity for BRD4. And BRD4 is a gene that uh, is, has a bromodomain, is a nuclear uh, protein, is one of those genes that we might have thought as undruggable. Yet he had noticed that uh, this benzodiazepine could target bromodomain and tweak the molecules, a derivative that fit perfectly to BRD4. And so now this molecule is in clinical trials. And so I hope that there are two examples I've given you through both through RNAi screening that we have found compounds, chemical, that were sitting on shelves, used for other purposes, that could be used for cancer. Could we now explore this possibility going broadly and testing all uh, chemicals and drugs that we have available? And this is something we can also do at High Throughput Screening Corps.